Today we are joined by Dr. Gabrielle Page Wilson and Alexandra Stanton, who are co-founders of Little Lives PPE, which is a black and woman led company that produces high quality personal protective equipment. It is developed and approved by doctors for kids, teens, and adults. And I should note that their face masks and face shields are all made right here in the US of A. I wanted to mention that Little Lives third partner, pediatrician Dr. Samira Brown is not joining us today. She's actually busy practicing medicine and, and is unavailable. So I'm, I'm happy to welcome both uh, Gabby and Alexandra to the, to the uh, keynotes today. Great to have you both. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And lovely to have you. Uh, I want to welcome our students, <clears throat> pardon me, our alumni and our friends from the Bank of America Institute for Women's Entrepreneurship at Cornell. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining today. Also our domestic and global audiences, and of course, everyone in the Cornell community and beyond. So today we're gonna, we're gonna discuss Little Lives' journey through their launch, what it took to quickly stand up their operation and how they scaled their business to meet the challenges of the last year. And I should mention that throughout audience, we're gonna take your questions, so please enter them in the chat. Uh, we'll, take, uh, we'll try to take them as they come. And uh, <clears throat> so please, what, whatever platform you're joining us on, whether it's at eCornell's uh, live stream or LinkedIn Live or Facebook, please enter your questions in there and we'll take them as they come. Uh, this event is being recorded. We are live right now. The recording will be available at this very same URL at the same page shortly afterward. We'll have to run some quick edits, so it should be available several minutes after we are through today. Uh, again, thank you both for joining me. So I want to kind of cut right to it. Um, Dr. Paige Wilson, paint a picture for us. Uh, what was the impetus for starting Little Lives PPE? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to believe it was 10 months ago, but, um, you know, thinking back to March very early on in the pandemic, really before there were any kind of CDC recommendations about how to keep ourselves safe, how to keep our families safe, um, you know, I was still sending my child to school at that point in time. Yeah. Um, and, and my primary concern um, back in March was really how to keep him safe. Um, my son has asthma and um, COVID-19 is primarily a respiratory illness. And so I wanted to make sure that he had the right sort of protection. And I um, reached out to one of my med school classmates from Harvard, Dr. Brown. Uh, she's, she's a close friend of mine. She's my de facto pediatrician every time I'm worried about my kids. Uh, unfortunately for her, I call her uh, before my own pediatrician. And yeah. um, we, we started talking about, about, you know, how to protect children. And we realized very quickly that um, there was almost nothing um, in the market um, in terms of personal protective equipment for children. That's face masks and face shields. There was only a single company at the time that had um, an FDA approved a surgical mask for children, and they were basically supplying, you know, every hospital and medical uh, facility in this country. And so, um, you know, we knew that if we were going to be thinking about at that point in time, when we first started talking about it, we actually um, hadn't shut down yet, but but we did shortly thereafter. And so we knew that if we were going to reenter the world safely, we were going to need some form of protection. Uh, and so we decided to, to enter the space. I know Alexandra uh, well, our sons are our are, are friends. And I think as a parent, as a mother, she shared my concerns. Um, for about how to keep kids safe. And she was um, kind enough at the time early in March to be volunteering her um, expertise to the task of getting PPE um, for, for um, frontline workers who needed it. And so I knew she had a lot of business expertise as well. And um, I reached out to her regarding the idea of creating high quality PPE for children and ultimately for families and communities. And, and uh, that's sort of, that's sort of how we came to be. Alexandra was, was, was game to, to, to get involved. Good. Um, you know, it's funny. Life is truly about connections everywhere you turn. Uh, that's usually how things come together for me, at least. Alexandra, let's talk about the beginning, right? So you've got two doctors coming to you saying, kind of, you know, obviously identifying a gap or a, a need in the marketplace. Uh, tough to see around corners those early days, for sure. But uh, how did you three come together? How did the business sort of take shape in the beginning? Sure. Well, as women do, right? We talk, we share our concerns, our fears. Gabby's a dear friend. I hadn't met Samira Brown, but I adored Gabby and knew that anyone that she adored would we all fit well together. And uh, you know, Gabby had you know 
was very concerned about her son and I was concerned about my two young sons who uh, are now eight and 11. And um, I had spent, as Gabby said, time from when the pandemic started getting PPE out of Asia. And it was very difficult uh, for a few reasons. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, the geopolitical tensions between uh, China and this country uh, would heat up on a regular basis. Frankly, every time uh, our current president said the words China virus, um, uh, you know, that was insulting to people in China who then had very little <laughs> you know, desire to, to help us. There were extensive delays on the ground. In addition, I, mean, I remember at one point there were 300 trucks on the road to get into Shanghai airport. We were six weeks delayed trying to get um, you know, PPE to teachers and hospitals and community clinics. And uh, it was a very tough experience. You live this night and day. And so when Gabby came to me and said, look, there's, there's this thing that we need to do. And I, I really think we ought to make it. My response was one condition, we're making it here. Uh -huh. um, it, not just for expediency and logistics and being able to deliver a quality product rapidly to those who need it, uh, but quality controls, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, as a mom, forget my, my business credentials. As a mother, nothing's going on my kid that I can't verify is safe, especially mm -hmm. something right up close here at the mouth, near the nose. Uh, you don't want them inhaling yucky stuff all day long. I mean, I remember ordering a box of masks off of Amazon once and I, I opened it. And I mean, I had to put it in an open window for two days. I just imagined down the bowels of a ship next to petrochemicals for three weeks with no ventilation. It's exactly what it smelled like. It went in the garbage. So, uh, you know, I, I think I had those business and efficiency and quality sensitivities. Mm -hmm. um, and Gabby and Samira, of course, had the medical expertise and medical necessity and needs expertise. And we simply came together. When you were first starting, this is just an unplanned question here, but uh, the price point uh, versus yeah. imports versus domestically making that, sure. what did you realize right away? Okay, this is how much it's going to cost, but maybe that's not so much an issue for people that are certainly concerned about their health and frankly scared to death. Look, how did that kind of stack up when you first started doing this? Sure. Well, it didn't take long on the research once Gabby and Samira figured out the design that they wanted, it didn't figure out long on the research to figure out. You know, American labor costs more. We're going to back it. We're an American company, and that's yeah. what this is. This is not a 25-cent face shield from China. Um, you know, we sell them in packs of five or ten. You buy ten, they're $7 each. The good news is they're reusable and recyclable. So, you know, I, my elder son plays basketball in his. He's had the same one for a month. So if you think about $7 over the course of the month, you know, it's, it's not bad. Um, and, you know, you can just you clean it with any non-bleach cleaner. So we knew that we wanted quality materials, American materials. Our medical grade foam uh, comes up from West Virginia over to Rochester, New York, where we're manufacturing. All right. Um, yeah, absolutely. Right. I'm a yeah. There you go. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Nice. Gabs, what do you think in terms of that question? Yeah, I mean, I think... I think, I mean, you're, you're alluding to something that's, it's, it's important. I think when we sort of step back and think about things from a, from an entrepreneurial um, standpoint, I mean, clearly your, your profit margins are going to be a lot bigger, you know, if you are creating something that, it, or selling something that, that you're, that you're import, an imported good that's a lot uh, less expensive to make. But I think, you know, for us are one of the great things in terms of developing our manufacturing partners is that we really found a company that um, really shared our ethos and our desire um, to, to help people. And they understood that that um, we needed to be price conscious because this was something that we wanted everybody in the population to to have access to. And so I think um, you know those those cost considerations were definitely on the table up front. You know, but but I think that negotiating um, a relationship with with um, with the manufacturers and with the people supplying the materials who share your your vision and your goals um, is critically important in get, getting to a reasonable place. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so let's talk about the first product you launched. How'd that go, what happened? Yeah, so the first product we launched um, were actually our face shield. So what, what I will say is this, you know, we, we started off with our objective really being to create high quality personal protective equipment that was essentially um, 
you know, me- medical grade that would allow us to offer products that release medical grade and quality to the general population. And our objective from the very start was to, to create uh, masks um, and to create face shields. And the reason for those two products was because, you know, we, in early on, we didn't have that much information, obviously, about COVID-19. And just logically speaking, we thought, if I, if I as a physician, seen a patient who has screened negative, right? So who doesn't have any of the classic symptoms of COVID, doesn't have, have a temperature. If the recommendation is when I enter a room with that person, I should have on um, a medical grade mask and a face shield that we felt that if we were going to um, a, re-enter society safely and prevent community transmission, that we should basically be, uh, be providing a similar level of product to the population. And so we... Okay. Um, started with the face shields, like I said, primarily because um, plastic was readily available, <laughs> uh, polypropylene, which is, is the material that, that, um, the surgic, that the masks are made out of, was less available. Um, and so we launched the face shields first. Um, there are also no pediatric face shields um, at the time that were um, really in the market. Um, and so creating one specifically for children um, that met actually the um, design specifications that the FDA recommends for kind of a medical grade face shield was really important to us. Alexander, did you have something to add? No? No. Oh, okay, good. I, I thought I saw you gesture there. So there's a couple of questions kind of coming in actually very quickly, um, which, which I think are, are interesting and something to kind of talk about, especially as you were getting started, supply chain issues, right? So we have... We have viewer uh, bank or, or banky who asked, how did you find companies willing to do so here in the US? I had to hang up my design. How did you find a manufacturer? Thomas.net was not helpful to say the least. Um, so how, how did that kind of play out from a supply chain? We talked about where you ended up sourcing, uh, sure. the, you know, um, the synthetic materials and so on sure. from West Virginia. Tell us how that worked out. Sure. Yeah. So uh, there were two pieces that had to occur before anyone picked up a phone. Uh, the first was to figure out uh, the sort of scale that we believed any plastics manufacturer would need to have. So, for example, early on, Gabula and Samir would remember this, um, we were talking to a manufacturer who was really allied with us and the values alignment and the synergies were great. But their capacity was tapping out at 25000 a week. Mm. That wasn't going to work. It just wasn't going to work. Yeah. And they didn't want to commit to a process of how to scale if we got there. You know, you yeah. want to envision for your company that you're going to be really successful. The last place you want to be as a business owner is you've finally got that market traction. You're scaling, you're scaling, you're ramping. Those sales are ticking up. And oh my God, what did you forget to do because you so liked your manufacturer? Ensure that if you needed 200000 a week, or half a million a week, right, that they could actually deliver. And we didn't want to uh, be short-sighted in that way. So, you know, we uh, made a list of everything that we thought we needed to assure in a really great partner, a plastics manufacturer. Um, we then put together a list of plastics manufacturers uh, and either both who were had deep expertise over 20 years in plastics and some who had been manufacturing face shields from what we could discern. And welcome to good old shoe leather. And we hit the phones. Yeah. Well, go ahead, Gabby. Sorry. No, I, I just want to echo that because I, I really can kind of identify with this person's question. I do think, you know, shoe leather is really an important aspect of things. I'm familiar with Thomas.net mostly because we were on it too in the beginning. And we did mm-hmm. generate huge lists of of manufacturers that we just cold called and reached out to. Um, and ultimately, and, and that was part of the process. So there was a lot of rejection, a lot of no's, a lot of just not quite right fits um, before before we found um, kind of the right partner. And I think that that's really important to acknowledge. And I think, you know, the, the other, other piece of this too, well, I'll stop there, but I think it's important to acknowledge. It did take a lot of work. It did take a lot of just, you know, putting things out there. What I was going to say though, is that, you know, because it was a pandemic, and because there was urgency and because I think there were a fair number of manufacturers whose, um, typical work was on hold, um, you know, because of the pandemic, 
there was a little bit more willingness at the time to diversify um, and a desire to do something that was going to potentially be revenue generating in a time when their usual work wasn't. And so yeah. there, there were some factors that are specific to the pandemic that also kind of facilitated relationship building. But let me jump in on something. Gabby remembers very well. There were a couple of manufacturers before we landed on ours. They had done a really cool shield design. We wanted to talk to them. We sent over an NDA because we're proprietary by our design. And, you know, I'm a lawyer by training. There are two kinds of lawyers in the world. Ones who see their job as to say no, and another who sees it as their job to help you get to yes. Yeah. And they threw up roadblock after roadblock and wouldn't sign our NDAs. And, you know, I remember calling this one owner saying, I'm trying to cut through this with you. I can't send this to you with no protection this could be a great, you know, merger here, great partnership, meet me halfway. And they couldn't do it. So, you know, there, there's lots of um, nuggets of wisdom in here about not overly staffing out decisions that you're not on top of uh, as a business owner. Many people who do manufacturing, uh, they didn't come through the humanities. They may not be comfortable reading, you know, draft contracts, for example, and they just staff it out to council. And, um, at, at their peril, frankly. And some folks lost out on some great deals. And then when we landed on our partner, I just, I remember that initial call and this man who was so human on the other end of the phone and just loved the idea and was willing to start sketching, was happy to sign the NDA. And it was, yes, sure, great. And it, it was that kind of I'm excited. This is fantastic. This has been needed. I could be your partner and we'll figure it out. That wonderful kind of very American can doism, bananas crazy. And we got to yes. That's beautiful. Uh, you know, I, I viewer uh, Boniswa who checks in. Uh, any certi uh, certifications, licenses, compliance issues that you had to kind of figure out uh, ahead of launch? Well, ahead of launch, presumably. What was so going on there? I mean, so, I mean, a couple different things. I mean, I think that whenever you're entering a space where you're dealing with um, medical devices on some level, these are often class one um, medical devices, yeah. um, there, there are certification kind of considerations. Because this, uh, we were creating products in the setting of a pandemic, there were um, some of these came in a form that was different um, yeah. than usual. So there were right. FDA issued, the FDA issued several, several EUAs or emergency use authorizations that sort of allowed you to produce products that met certain specifications yeah. without yeah. going through an intensive FDA um, certification process because that's such a timely process and, and taking that time wasn't, wasn't possible. So, so, um, so we were able to kind of, in terms of our products, circumvent some of those certifications. The other certifications that we felt were important because we are um, a majority black owned business business and a woman owned business were the um, WMBE certifications. And those are we are M um, MBE certified uh, by the National Development Council. And that's something that we sort of started that process and just kind of it wasn't done at the time of launch. It's sort of, you know, just something that we continue to do. And we're still uh, getting our women certification. And, and so I think that there, you know, we tried not to let those things impede our ability um, to just to run fast, to move fast um, and to, to launch. You know, I've got all these questions kind of sitting here in the hopper, but the ones that are coming in from the audience, frankly, are pretty compelling. There's right. a couple questions here. Uh, Chris D. asks, this is a multi-part question. Chris D. asks, what are your marketing efforts? And somebody else had actually chimed in kind of mentioning, and I wasn't aware of this, actually. Ads for PPE were banned during the, um, do you know about this? Oh, What's going on with that? Of course we do. I don't know anything about it. Of course we do. <laughs> what happens? Of course we do. What yeah. happens? <laughs> Yeah. They were banned because. Uh, so, just explain. Yeah. I should I take this, Alex? Or yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right. So you know, I think one of the things that's been so tricky about about the pandemic and some of the recommendations regarding personal protection has been a, a dearth or lack of resources, right? And so early on in the pandemic, unfortunately, you know, the CDC's recommendations that everybody should wear a cloth mask. Uh, or a cloth face covering, whatever they said initially, um, were really based on the fact that that's all we could offer the population at that time, right? 
there were frontline workers who didn't have kind of, you know, polypropylene, medical grade, surgical masks, N95. And so we couldn't say to the population, well, everybody needs to wear the best possible protection because we didn't have it for the people who needed it most. Yeah. And so the recommendations became for, you know, kind of cloth face coverings. And I think they are evolving and will continue to evolve now that we Uh do have, there is sort of more product availability. But so so I think what happened early on is you couldn't advertise PPE because they didn't, and things like a, um, that wasn't, you couldn't uh, advertise things that weren't cloth masks because they didn't want to um, divert products to the population that they felt like needed to be actually um, prioritized for frontline workers. So yes, mm-hmm. that was. I think they were also worried about being able to validate the claims, right, Gabby? You think that the compliance team at Amazon has the medical know-how to figure out how to ASTM level two, three, one medical versus non-medical? I mean, really tough. Absolutely, uh, yeah. for sure. And, and I, so I would say this: um, marketing. So there's B2B and there's B2C. We certainly uh, understood that one of the ways to rise above a lot of the nameless, faceless PPE companies that don't have the kind of thought leadership that we have, we're doctors, we're mothers. Uh, You know, we come at this with our very personal stories and it's excellent, high quality, highly tested, made here. Good luck finding another company like that. I would challenge anyone on this, you know, looking in right now. I'd love to know about them because we haven't found them and we check regularly. So one was rise, rise, rise above the morass, right? And put um, expertise and credentials and testing behind everything we do because this is for children and for our families. That was bucket one. Bucket two is while B2C is really important and we're uh, entering the D2C space to be sure, um, B2B can take you into institutional sales where it doesn't have to be competing for the lowest price on Amazon, right? So if you figure out the sectors, and we certainly have uh, gotten some interesting toeholds uh, in a couple of them, teachers, for example, um, we feel really honored uh, that the American Federation of Teachers picked our shield over everyone else's for their teachers. Amazing. Uh, uh, we feel really honored about that. Um, and they customize their shield. You can customize. And uh, it, it was great. And it's a partnership that, you know, keeps going. Um, children with special needs. I actually love Gabby to talk about this uh, piece. But, I, you know, yeah. suffice it to say, you figure out your sectors. You drive to it. You figure out why your product is special and can enable the person in that population to live a more free life. And you'd be surprised. People meet you halfway sometimes. But Gabs, you want to take this one? Well, I would just say in terms of marketing, just to sort of dovetail on that, I think understand really kind of having a comprehensive comprehensive understanding of your niche and really understanding kind of um, being able to communicate what you bring to the table and what's unique about your brand is so important, especially in this pay- space, as Alexandra indicated, that's kind of flooded with all sorts of products. I mean, um, people, I think consumers often um, and institutions, they're looking for, they, they want clarity uh, and they want it to come from an informed and reliable source. And so I think really, um, you know, Leaning, leaning into our expertise, I think, has been a very important part of our marketing strategy. For um, sure. For sure. I'm sensitive, though. I mean, you know, we don't just do shields, right, Christopher? So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, Gabby, you might want to chat a bit about the mask with Christopher with your permission. But we started marketing, uh, creating, actually, manufacturing face masks uh, made in California. Gabby, yeah. you want to talk a bit yeah, about that? Tell us that? about that, please. Yeah. So, um, so as I, as I think I said, you know, masks were always on the agenda. Polypropylene is, is, um, hard to come by and rightfully so, um, the majority of that product was diverted, um, to the front lines and, um, and, but over time as other, um, domestic manufacturers and people started to, to, to create, create polypropylene and it became readily more available, there was room for us to enter this space, um, and start creating high quality polypropylene polypropylene face mask for the population. The reason why we care about polypropylene um, and why this was kind of the fabric that we wanted to use is because this is what's uh, used in the majority of um, surgical face masks and 95s, things that are um, medical grade products. And it's used because it has a 
high filtration capacity, so very good at keeping keeping uh, particles out um, and preventing them um, from from going out. So it's protecting both ways. Um, and in addition to, to it having a high filtration capacity, um, it's also, it, it also um, is great in terms of sort of just having breathe, breathability. Um, mm-hmm. When we actually look at um, face masks, you know, cloth face masks, like three Hanes t-shirts um, has a filtration capacity of about 30%. So it's going to keep out and in about 30% of, of droplets. Most of us want a higher level of protection. We know from a big study that came out in the Lancet um, in, in July that uh, tw- a, a thickness in terms of cloth or cotton face mask of 12 to 16 layers is comparable to a polypropylene surgical mask. Wow. Um, so there are very few fa- uh, <laughs> fabrics. So this is what you want to wear. So there are very few uh, cloth face masks that are that thick um, that are readily available, mostly because when you get that thick, the issue becomes breathability. And so polypropylene yes. is a product that allows both for uh, filtration and breathability. Um, and then the other thing that we really focused on in terms of face mask was fit, right? Because that yeah. confers, fit matters, right? <laughs> if you are wearing a mask that has a great filtration capacity, it's made of the best materials, but there are huge gaps on the side, you know, it's not conferring protection. And so we really focused on all of those things, thinking about um, ch- child development, thinking about the ch- uh, the size of a child's face um, to to size mass and come up with, with a mass product that was really going to confer um, protection while simultaneously being wearable. That's the other thing. It's got to be comfortable or people aren't going to keep it on and a mask that's not worn properly isn't protecting anybody. That's right. I mean, we all go through our, our individual individual discomforts, right? Some bend right. our ears down. We like some that go oh. around. Uh, you know, glass is always fog. If you can solve that, then great. Well, <laughs> well, well, we solved on the face shield because our face shields are of such a high yeah. quality yeah. that if you put it on, on top of your, uh, in fact, I'll show you right now. All right. Our face shield. I love there these. You go. I'm glad you brought those along. Uh, of course I did. Yeah. And here go the glasses. All right. Yeah. So we were able to solve it with our shields and will not fog. And it's basically based on the design of the foam. Yeah, right, up top it allows for a little airflow. There you go. Well, listen, this well, actually is actually it's sealed. That's no, or, or sealed. Okay. Yes. That's what that's a requirement for it to be a medical grade face shield. So face shields are not right. basically uh, if there is airflow here, then particles get in. And that oh. is counterproductive. So in terms, if you're going to meet the FDA EUA specifications for a medical grade face shield, there should be no gap between the oh. front of the shield and the forehead. So, you know, my, my boys play hoops in these shields. They last at least a, a month. They clean them with a non-bleach cleaner. They're reusable. You know, I have to often have to wear masks to go, you know, places. But if I'm running errands with my kids on weekends, CVS, Target, whatever, we just pop on our shields. And it's so nice not to have something sitting right on your on your mouth. But the other thing I want to go back to about the masks is, yes, we made them to great medical uh, specifications, ASTM level three, all made in U.S. These are made in San Diego. Mm-hmm. And then, frankly, we got cute with the colors. I mean, come on now, yeah. right? We are all tired of that blue. So, first of all, they all sound, if you can see it, they all say made in USA on them. Cool. Every single one. But everything from black, because, right, ladies, don't we like to have our black? And to the hot pinks, right? to ones that are just so cute that have like for kids, little fish on them, puppies, kittens. You know, we just came out with pale pink and tangerine orange. Uh, We have a rainbow pack. And so, so many of us are tired of being in this pandemic. One of the ways that we saw that children like to get a little of their agency back, a little bit more kind of control over their lives, is to match their mask with their outfit or their backpack. And so we're actually in two weeks coming out with one with rainbows and unicorns on it, so cute. We have a, a blue Levi's denim, like dark jean one coming out. We can play and the market wants that. We are also sick of that surgical blue. Yeah. Um, so like my husband, for example, he loves the gray and the black. Um, my sons love the ruby red, the jade, the purple, uh, you know, and the dark blue. Uh, and my sons love kittens. So they actually both like the kitten mask. 
Yeah. And so, you know, it, 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 this is, we're a business, right? We're catering to the consumer. We're all in this for quite a while, right? And because of that, we need options. Not just as Gabby talked about having inclusive, a range of PPE, of high quality medical grade face masks, as well as face shields, but also colors and patterns so we don't get bored. Yeah, that's perfect. You know, I, I want to switch gears a little bit because I'm, I, I'm seeing a through line in some of the chatter. Okay. This is about business structure and the yeah. role of a lawyer, legal representation, having oh, yeah. somebody on board. You know, this is a recurring theme that I hear in my conversations with entrepreneurs um, and even lawyers as well. The, you know, I, I've talked to n- numerous people at Cornell Law who kind of work in this space. Can you discuss the role? I mean, you know, you have the benefit of having a, a legal background. Not every team has this, but I mean, can you can you offer some advice on how somebody should think about their lawyers? I've heard like it's, a, it's essentially in a business advisor role and really kind of helps people, again, you know, sort of learn the things they, they didn't even know that they didn't know. You know what I mean? So can you describe your role as a lawyer on a, on a team? Uh, of course. And I, I want to say at the outset, yeah. that despite me being a lawyer, member of the bar of the state of New York, and very able to read contracts and poke yeah. holes and all the rest of it, we do have a lawyer uh, uh, who's a commercial contracts uh, and just commercial law expert. Yeah. Because I would say that whatever sector you're in, you really do want someone who stays abreast of the legal evolution in your state, in uh-huh. that sector. And yeah. that is not just my, you know, anyone's general knowledge of you know, US contractual law or employment law. Um, so I, I think it's great to have, you have to find someone, if you're just starting out at the right price point, who's going to work with you, who's committed to those values. Ideally, you've got someone who's worked, uh, either in, um, uh, maybe e- if you're us, maybe with e-commerce or in the health space or just, you know, a deep, uh, understanding of business law. I also find, you know, given that we're in New York and, um, we're dealing with a lot of, uh, you know, folks who are quite senior in their businesses, um, having someone who's got some real credentials, uh, you know, helps, frankly, if ever our attorney, right, Gabby has to get on the phone, right? He went to a great law school. He worked at a top shelf law firm. Uh, He's taken seriously. Uh, It just helps. Uh, That may be peculiar to New York, but, um, you know, we're running so helter skelter because this business is scaling so rapidly. Yay. Uh, that it's, it's you know, uh, he really is another member of the team. I think it's very helpful. I don't think it's mission critical. I understand. Okay. Let me ask you another uh, question kind of related to this. Uh, let's go, let's go over to funding, startup funding. How, what, what, what did you kind of, what, what did you have to go through? Um, and what, what path did you choose for, for funding this venture at the outset? So, Gabby, why don't I start? Then you, you know, maybe you want to fill in. I mean, we it was a yeah. little bit of a unique situation. Okay. Um, so, you know, each of us are three working professionals. We each put in a, a, what I think is a to start a business quite a very a small amount of money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I in my day job, so to speak, or what I generally do is I have a company that does business development for technology companies. It's what I do. So Mm -hmm. we do a lot of med tech and green tech and smart cities. And that's a lot of what we do. So I have a team. So um, we have backstopped, you know, the business uh, and the business is headquartered out of here. It's the mailing address. There are people that work here. There are interns, there's research, et cetera. So um, it was a bit of a unique situation, I I would say. Then Gabby, you want to, you want to pick up on that? Yeah, no, I think definitely. Um, it was unique in that aspect. I mean, Alexandra, as she spoke to, had um, resources that we could pour into the company that wouldn't otherwise have been available to us um, uh, to sort of support the day-to-day operations of the business. Um, and so that that piece has been incredibly important. Um, and I do think you know, we didn't fundraise, um, mostly oh. because this was a rapid... Um, you know, we, we launched quickly and we started selling quickly, fortunately. Um, and ultimately, sort of that revenue was able to just fund the, the operations of the company. Uh, I, I want to just comment on, on, on the rapidity that Gabby just alluded to. We went from idea to selling in 11 weeks. Holy. Uh-huh. Holy. Wow. 11. 11 sleepless weeks. I'm That's sure. right. And they remain <laughs> sleepless. Let's be That's clear. Right. That's right, 11 
weeks. Mm-hmm. We were we started selling. Remember, get last in, in end of July, yeah. we started selling, uh, and it was it. The response was just tremendous, and it's been great. That's great to hear. You know, somebody commented and said, uh, how the hell did you have time to do all this <laughs> as working mothers? Um, you find the time, right? That's how you do it. So I uh, think this is, you know, one thing I will say, because I think that's really, really important is that, um, you know, I, and, and, I, and Alexandra and I laugh now on some level, you know, um, I think there are a couple points. I wasn't an entrepreneur before this. I've always been, I'm a physician scientist by training. I've always been an ideas person. I always had a yeah. million and one ideas, um, but mm-hmm. was actually somewhat scared to jump into this space, basically because I felt like it wasn't my wheelhouse, the entrepreneurial space. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the pandemic created um, a comfortable environment to just get things done um, yeah. and just to just to just do it. I think that there was an all hands on deck kind of momentum that I um, attach myself to. But I think that the way that um, so so we laugh now because I had no idea what I was getting myself into. But what I will say is that, um, you know, in terms of how you make it work, it does require some really significant um, support as a mother. Um, and so my husband was tremendously supportive um, and available, you know, made himself available to sort of support the efforts of raising our children in a completely different way. I also had a bunch of babysitters. I mean, like, oh, yeah. you know, your time is not your own and you will not sleep. You, you know, you will spend count every out hour that you're not, you know, a, of your day will be, um, will be used, particularly if you still have another job, which, um, which I do and I try to do well. Um, and so I think that there, there is a lot of sort of personal and self-sacrifice and that's not to be um, underemphasized. I think that that's a very real thing. And on some level, you know, my children have not, <laughs> especially in the first 11 weeks, they were not getting my attention in a way that they were used to. And I, you know, I have some guilt about that, but, um, but ultimately they'll be, they're resilient. They'll be okay. I would also say you have to really think about um, time availability. If uh, I was working as a partner in a law firm, 100 hours a week, and Gabby was only seeing patients uh, and running two fellowships, Samira, our third co-founder, she sees patients. She, she's a working pediatrician. You know, her time is less. She has less working business hours than we do. Yeah. So you have to think about that. You know, I, I, I am at my office. I'm here now. Uh, this, uh, this is what I, I do. I, I grow businesses. I scale them. I, I, so, you know, if I had been in a different sector, you really, it, it doesn't just happen by accident. Someone's either going to say, I'm not pursuing those fellowships. I'm not pursuing that grant at my hospital, right? I'm going to focus on this. Someone has to say, I'm not taking other clients. I'm doubling down here. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, it's, it's got to, the person who might be working the most might say, I got to take a couple of weeks off. Whatever it is, I mean, you really have to get real about this stuff fast and, and, and have a, a a series of uh, kind of drill down conversations around time, because here's the deal. I mean, Gabby and I and, I and Samira, there are some people who are happy to return my calls at nine o'clock at night. Most don't. Mm-hmm. Most of this work happens in business hours. Most. That doesn't mean we don't research. We can't do stuff on our website. We can't do lots of other stuff, but most people don't want to have conference calls at eight o'clock at night. And so you have to think about as you scale when it hits, because every single person watching this should believe that their business is going to hit. If it hasn't already, how are you going to handle demand? Don't think about it later. Plan for it. It's just like how the three of us planned for a manufacturer that could handle when those big orders come in and six figure orders came in for us, which is great, but we planned for it. We were ready. Speaking of being ready, uh, George and Boniswa and several others have asked here uh, about sales channels, distribution, uh, how you kind of reached buyers. Uh, you know, you had discussed kind of in, in pretty pretty good depth how you differentiated your product and your business. Uh, how did that kind of work out in the beginning? Uh, you know, how were you how were you selling this stuff? Where, where were your primary channels? Where are they now? Where did you have to pivot? Give us that whole kind of year long snapshot there. I can start with a, an approach I thought was quite effective for us. So okay. we, if you go to our website at littlelivespppe.com, yep. we've done some press. Uh, we got an early mention in the Wall Street Journal 
and then all of a sudden, uh, we got approached by Fox.com. Uh, and and we, they did an almost six-minute interview of myself and Gabby. Mm-hmm. Uh, Samira recently did a, a great uh, piece in Atlanta uh, on air, one of the main TV shows. Uh, we had an almost full page in the Daily News, a, a New York newspaper, like a literally full page. Wow. Uh, I mean, we've had uh, some good press, and that, that drives sales. Yep. Uh, we are established in our careers, which I think is helpful. So we had our own set of contacts, and we reached out to people. And we, you know, you can't be shy when you're doing what you're doing, right? We have no shame at this point. We email everybody round the clock, call them twice, call them four times, ask their mothers. You know, you hustle, right? Don't have a business if you're not prepared to hustle. So uh, it was, it was. I think press helped us, you know, quite a bit. Some early B two B sales, um, uh, some counties uh, in New York. Uh, for example, before we had the masks and we had the face shields, you know, folks were buying the face shields. Someone bought a county bought ten thousand of them. Actually, Monroe County in in, in Rochester, there you go. in Rochester again, upstate yeah. New York, yeah. um, uh, bought them because they wanted the youth in the county to be able to go play sports, and they got really concerned if they were only in masks. And sweat went flying, it would go into someone's eyes. And their medical reviewer said, you know, Alexandra, the eyes are a mucosal surface. I said, yes, ma'am, they are. Um, and so, you know, we got to protect them. I said, okay, fine. So, you know, we had some good B2B sales. I think governments, I think localities, teachers, nonprofits, businesses, unions um, should never, never be overlooked as excellent partners. I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so impressed with your, uh, you know, focus on institutions, municipalities, and so on. One effort that I do want to focus on, let's tell me a little bit about your effort to supply masks and shields to homeless shelters. I have a resource that I want to share with the audience, but please tell me how that kind of took shape and, and what's going on there. Yeah, so one of the things we were thinking about, um, you know, very early on, uh, I think we, we've always been sort of mission driven. And I think the reality is that the, fundamentally, this company is about about helping people. Um, and so when we started to step back and think about kind of who's most vulnerable amidst all of this, we definitely felt that homeless children and families were incredibly vulnerable, just um, having access and resources to, P, you know, access to PPE or the resources to purchase PPE, to clean PPE you know, face masks when needed, et cetera, um, you know, we're just much more limited. And so um, we partnered with um, basically organizations that were supporting homeless families, WIN um, here in New York, uh, Mm -hmm. Women in Need, which is one of the largest uh, providers of of shelters for homeless families, um, and then in Atlanta Children's Shelters. And we basically committed to um, provide them with, um, with, you know, to meet their PPE needs uh, during the year. And then we also sort of set up uh, the ability on our website for individual consumers to donate a shield or donate a box of masks. And it's been um, Hmm. really moving in terms of sort of how many consumers actually, when they're coming to our site to purchase something, also will will donate. Um, So... I I wanna pick up on that. Uh, You can never underestimate the generosity uh, and the goodwill uh, of people. And I think Gabby and I and Samira so share the belief that, you know, you come to people with good intentions and they'll meet you, you know, and if they don't, right. But so many people, as Gabby said, you know, this morning I started to see uh, maybe in anticipation, you know, of this, people were buying boxes of masks to donate to shelters. It was so moving. Um, you know, you can imagine that you know, children in homeless shelters don't have the highest quality PPE. And so that is really uh, extraordinary. We donate, we purchase, and we donate throughout the year. And we make sure, right, that there's not a month that goes by, that if there's a gap in need. And when in New York, by the way, they have 13 shelters. Women in Need runs the largest system of shelters for children and families in New York. It's huge. They have 3,000 children going through on any given week, and we want to make sure that they're safe. So it feels, it feels great. You know, you do good and you do well at the same time, right? Yeah, beautiful stuff. I'm so glad I asked. Uh, viewer Jan checks in. As a mom, thank you for these products. Uh, I just ordered face shields and masks mm-hmm. on your site. Super easy. Looking back on your business venture, is there anything that you would do differently? There must have been some hard lessons learned through this. 
we're learning hard lessons every day. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? Um, you know, that's a hard question. Okay, uh, I'm going to, all right, I'll make it simpler. Uh, let's talk about customer relationship management, customer satisfaction, customer feedback. How does that all play out? I mean, let, let's talk strategic and tactical. How do you think about that part of your business, right? So you sell, to, what, what was it, 10,000 masks to Monroe County. What happens after that? How do you do the follow-up? Where is the, how do you close the loop on conversations with customers? That was six questions, but go for it. So I think in terms of, you know, our, our, our consumers, we really kind of invite feedback and we try to kind of make that clear, um, you know, on our site that we invite feedback. Um, and we've been sort of pleasantly, um, because I think especially in the pandemic where information is rapidly evolving, our understanding of how we protect ourselves is rapidly evolving, um, you know, and, and we were making a lot of decisions and choices and recommendations as data was still coming out. We needed to feel like we could partner with the people who were, who are um, using our products to make them a, as good as possible to make sure they're fitting the child children properly when or adults properly and so I think we kind of have invited that feedback on our website and and made and been pleasantly surprised by people kind of reaching out with positive feedback with suggestions about how we um, can do things better and we've been quite receptive to that um, from a consumer's uh, space um, in terms of supporting customers I mean that's critically important. <laughs> Uh, I think, you know, you, you have to designate a person who, whose responsibility it is to respond to all customer concerns and fees, feedback. Um, and, you know, that that can be quite a demanding task um, sometimes. But I think that um, it, it's really it's it's really kind of a critical part of, of, of what we do. Alex, do you want to talk about relationships with like more of the B2B I, I think what I want to respond to Jan. First of all, thank you for your business. We really appreciate it. I, I want to answer your question. I think it's a really good one. And I think it's a hard one. Because everyone has to wear a mask, at least in certain states, but in many of that you have to wear a mask. Uh, it's in some ways hard to figure out where to focus. And I think if I were to do it again, uh, we would have um, driven harder and more narrowly at the sectors where clearly there was early resonance and we would have focused like a laser and gone. Mm -hmm. We definitely, all of us, uh, did a lot of dipping toes here and there. Uh, and, and the truth of it is, um, and listen, we can wholesale, we can get those prices down for a large volume, we can you know, do it all. I can't compete with a two cents a mask from China. I just can't do it. And I also don't want it, right? Yeah. But it means that there are some areas, I mean, think about a state mm -hmm. like, I don't know, I think about any state that has gotten very hard hit where unemployment's very high, it means their tax revenue is low. It means that, do I think that a lot of government agencies can afford to buy only American made, most likely not. Yeah. We definitely explored that a bit, Me, you know, uh, I, I spent years in government, so, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't do that again. It was, I, I think I would have driven earlier and quicker. And so, I mean, in full disclosure, we've already come together. We did a whole sectoral analysis where we're focusing like a laser. Um, and, so, and so, Jen, I hope that that answers your question. If not, come back to me. Uh, I, I would also say that in terms of customer follow-up, it's funny, I was on the phone with Monroe County yesterday. So um, uh, she called because she saw the masks on our site and she said, oh my gosh, look at that gorgeous pale pink. My mother's going to love those. And so, <laughs> and, and, listen, you know, you know, her son wants the tangerine orange. You know, that's a new product. Anyway, so, uh, you know, we started to talk about, you know, how can we work with the nonprofits? How can we work with additional organizations? What about other unions in Monroe County? And she just sent me a whole list this morning of emails and people she's connected us to um, uh, because she knows that the product is quality and she's a mom as well as a working person. And so um, you have to stay in touch with your customers. We message them. If anyone goes to, you know, check out and doesn't check out, they get an email from us, you know. So yeah, yeah. we are definitely on it. Um, but we are, let me just say, if we haven't said it already, any thoughts on uh, that you all may have, all of you coming to this 
conversation um, are business people, people that have businesses, aspire to have businesses, already had businesses, are working and starting a business and raising kids or taking care of parents, sandwich generation, right? So um, let's, uh, we would love your ideas. We, um, uh, we have a sense about sectors where we want to focus, but gosh, you know, especially as, you know, women in our careers, um, being open to great feedback has been critical for all three of us. Mm-hmm. And uh, in my estimation, there's no such thing as a dumb idea. We may not execute on it, but we'd love the conversation. So I know at the end of this, uh, Christopher is going to put uh, contact info into the chat and have at it. Yeah, exactly. I've got a few resources to, sh- to uh, share. You know, I have a question here. Um, so we're about a year into this crisis. It feels like a lifetime. Do you see any, you know, I mean, if there's one thing we've learned pivoting from hard lessons to this, which is, it's really hard to look two weeks into the future, let alone two months, let let alone across the quarter, right? So, I mean, we're deep into this. Do, do you see any emergent opportunities for you? Do you do you anticipate any kind of shifts? How how might mass vaccination figure into your business plan over the next four months? I mean, you know, I, these are all probably the toughest questions, and of course, I saved them for second to last, but. Um, what do you think about that? These are incredibly yeah. tough questions, but but important ones. And I think, you know, we in entering this space, we knew that there there was potentially uncertainty in, in terms of um of about the how long our trajectory would be as a company. But the reality is um Unfortunately, um, you know, while we're vaccination efforts are underway, I got my vaccine a couple of weeks ago, um, and I hope that the majority of the population will do the same. I think that um, this isn't over. I, I think this is this is unfortunately. Um, I think while we know that vaccinations um, offer a high level of protection against getting symptomatic disease they may not protect you against getting asymptomatic COVID. And so there's still a risk that even though I've been vaccinated, I could be positive with COVID and spread it to someone else. And uh, so until the entire population uh, is vaccinated and until the entire population is vaccinated with with the condition being that the virus doesn't mutate before then, um, in a way that's not responsive to the vaccine, um, you know, we're, we're going to need masks, and I think that um, and shields and PPE, and I think it's going to be part of um, our lives for some time. The other underlying thing, unfortunately, is that you know, if we look over the la- course of the last ten years, you know, this isn't the first new infectious illness, right? SARS, MERS, H one N one, now COVID nineteen. Right. We are seeing new viruses and and diseases popping up on a frequent basis, probably because of climate change. Right. When climate changes, new things, the climate changes, new things can live. And unfortunately, some of those things um, impact us adversely. And so I think what we've learned from this uh, so far is that preparedness is critical. And so I think while there may be an ebb and flow in terms of the market for PPE, God willing, there will be a time, unfortunately for our business, but fortunately for our lives, where we need less PPE. I think that um, remaining in this space will be important because there's a lot of uncertainty about what's to come. Alexandra. Yeah, if I can amplify on that. So whether you're a parent, whether you don't have kids, but you take care of your parents or an elderly relative or friend, whether you look after your nieces and nephews or whether you simply take care of yourself, all of this stuff is hard, right? Think about what's in your medicine cabinet. You probably keep some Advil. You might keep some Tylenol. Uh, You know, there's a whole variety of things that you keep on hand, stuff for headaches, maybe, uh, you know, some kind of, um, uh, you know, cream for burns, things like that. Well, you know, Gabby and I believe you should have uh, a couple face shields and a pack of masks. It's going to become, if it isn't already, part of what you keep at home. Gabby is, of course, absolutely right. Every two years we're seeing swine flu, you know, SARS, MERS, et cetera. You still have to live. You still have to be in, you know, community with people. You still have to take care of your children or your parents or your friends or your aunties. And you, you know, you have to be able to leave the house and go to the grocery store. How are you going to do it? You keep shields around and you keep masks and you make sure that what they're made of 
isn't hurting you. And I think that's where this is going to be going forward. Thank you so much. You know, I see us running up against the hour. Um, so for so for our audience uh, who has been watching today, again, many entrepreneurs uh, yeah. among them, any last words of wisdom, anything that you want to kind of send us off with, um, lovely messages of hope there and, and, and preparedness, I think is a, is a great kind of takeaway too, right? It's um, something we all need to get a little bit better at, I think. I, I have a, a couple of just business thoughts here. Yeah. And, and, and in about, I'd say four to six weeks, we are coming out with one more product. Um, so we're very excited about that. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, you focus like a laser. Don't get distracted when you have an idea that you really believe in. Test it. Try and, you know, evolve it. And then if you feel you've got to put it down, put it down. But don't get like, you know, a squirrel pinging here, pinging there, uh, and, and filled with self-doubt. If Whether you're going to raise money for your company, whether you're going to uh, try to meet with folks who are run bigger businesses to make sales or contacts, you have to be unbelievably confident. No one wants to do business with people who they think is shaking their boots, who then they won't trust to execute properly on business. This is business, y'all, right? So mm -hmm. you focus like a laser and you really set yourself a process by which you're going to test it. If it doesn't work, nothing wrong with failing. You learn from failing. But don't get distracted in these early days because it will just kill the business early on. Yeah. I just to, just to dovetail on that, and I think it's so important in terms of sort of lessons learned, you know, I think uh, someone said this to me early on, which was run and run fast. And I think yeah. that um, that's really critical. You've got to move fast. And I think as Alex alluded to, when things don't work out, um, you know, small things, obviously you're focused on, on your overall mission, but when things don't work out, you've got to pivot. I, so I think you need to kind of have that flexibility and that willingness to kind of to, to, to be agile, to be adept, to move and adapt, um, and to realize that sometimes the things in early on, what your website's going to look like, what the brand is going to be like, these seem like these huge things when you're starting. And as you move forward, you realize how small they actually are. <laughs> you, know, right. you have in the scheme of things. And that's a lesson learned from me, Alex. That's why Alex is laughing. That's why I'm laughing. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, you just have to be flexible and confident and keep the faith. Like Alex said, that, that you, you've got a great idea, run with it, and, and you'll be successful ultimately. If I can add one, one thing to that, yeah. you know, this is uh, a session for women entrepreneurs. Lean on the women in your life. Yeah. We're very lucky. We bounce off. We're verbally whiteboarding all day long, right, around here. Mm -hmm. uh, lean on that, right? Create your crew. Maybe it's, you know, once a week, you've got two folks you go to for a half hour. You don't take up too much of their time, but you check something, right? They may send you a message in the middle of the week. Ask your bestie to check in on a Wednesday morning just for a pickup. Have a, have a kind of virtual coffee, right? Put those building blocks in place. You know you. You know your insecurities. You know what scares you. Buffer against it with your friends and your family, and you'll be able to lead with your chin. Alexandra Stanton, Dr. Gabrielle uh, Page uh, Wilson, thank you so much for joining today. It's been a pleasure. Audience, thank you. Great questions, by the way. They kind of ran the whole thing, to be honest. Oh my goodness. Uh, you know, you, you plan and then you pivot, right? So hopefully it looks like we pirouetted. Um, and we have action items in the chat, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so I've shared those resources with everyone in the audience, newsletter, um, homeless shelter donation, in addition to the Little Lives PPE website. So thank you so much. It's been truly a genuine pleasure. I, I really appreciate you too. Thank you so much. Hanging out today. Thanks, everyone. Pleasure. See, you. See you next time, everyone. See you next time.